One of my favorite places in the whole world is the beach. I love the beach. I love everything about the beach. I like the sand. I like the sun. I like sunscreen. I like beach chairs. I like books on the beach. I like the birds that walk around on the beach. I like looking at the water. I like being at the water. I like the beach. I love the beach. The only thing I don't like about the beach is how difficult it is to keep your sunglasses clean. Yeah, because I'm kind of like, I don't want to say anal, but anal about keeping my glasses clean and it bother, you know, and you just can't read on the beach and I read a lot on the beach. You can't read on the beach and keep your sunglasses clean. So yeah, I take like sunglass cleaner with me to the beach. I'm so hung up on that. But other than that, everything about the beach is awesome. If you are a beach goer, and some of you are, if you are a beach goer, what kind of beach goer are you? How do you feel about the water? Do you plan a vacation to the beach, one in which you drive long distances? You are anxious to get there, and then once you get there, you change quickly. You grab your chair, your sunscreen, your book, your cooler. You walk to the beach in a brisk walk. You set up the chair. You plop down into the chair and never, ever enter the water during your entire vacation. Do not raise your hand (laughs) if this is you. Now, there's no law. There's no law against doing that. Lots of people doing that. It's okay to do that. It's okay. Or are you the person who sets up the chair? You get everything around you, including the blanket and the cooler and and your wristwatch on the handle of the cooler so that you can keep an eye on your vacation so it's not going by too quickly. And you have the snack bag at your arm's reach. And maybe once or twice a day, you walk to the water. And you go up to your knees. Maybe that's you. Or do you go in up to your waist if the water's not too cold and you splash the water up onto your arms if the sun is too hot? Or do you occasionally go into the water up to your shoulders such that you are like, you can like bounce on the rolling waves, being careful not to get your hair wet? And you're so careful about not getting your hair wet, so confident about that that you wear your best sunglasses and your hat into the water because you know there's no way you're going to let that water get over your head. Or, or are you a person who once you reach the beach, you drop everything? Chair, book bag, hat, sunglasses, kick off your rainbow sandals, you pull off your t-shirt as fast as you can, and you run as fast as you can, and you dive into the water, and you swim, and you swim some more, feeling the rush of the water passing over your body, and recognizing that the water is colder the further out you go, and the deeper you swim. You are immersed in it. It is touching every part of you. It is running through your hair. You jump into the waves, and you allow them to crash over you. You ride the waves, letting them carry you, letting the waves have their way with you. They toss you about. They flip you over. Is that you? Who drives as far as we drive to the beach and does not enjoy the water in that way, throwing themselves into it? Who does that? Well, a lot of people do that. A lot of people don't get any closer. Some of us do that because I could tell. Some of you were nodding as I was going through the list. Now, I know that not everyone loves the beach. Not everyone thinks it's the best place to vacation. Some people don't like the water at all. They are afraid of the water. Some people don't swim at all. That's okay. That's okay. That's who you are, and that's fine. But I'm thinking about this beach and water image as a way to consider our relationship with God. It's a metaphor for how we are with God. So the question I have for today is, are you allowing yourself to be immersed in God? Are you willing to yield yourself to God? Are you willing to allow God to have his way with you? Or are you a safe distance from the water, far enough back so you won't get wet. Today is the sixth Sunday in our series of messages based on John Ortberg's book, The Me I Want to Be, which has this marvelous subtitle, Becoming God's Best Version of You. 
And if this is your first week with us, or if you have fallen behind, let me share some assumptions upon which the book is based. And these are just a number of Scripture passages. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1, 1. God created man in God's own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, God created them. Genesis 1, 27. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of children of God. Galatians 4, 4. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it in all its fullness. John 10.10 I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells in you, he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14.16 and 17 those are some, some critical scriptures that help us to embrace some assumptions. Let me just phrase these another way, a little bit shorter. God created everything, friends. God created everything. God created us in God's image. God sent Jesus to the world for us. Jesus came that we may have life in all its fullness and God sends the Holy Spirit to each of us to live in us and to guide us in our pursuit of life in all its fullness. You see, God made us to be a certain way. God designed us. We function best when we operate the way God intended for us to operate. Cars are designed to function to use gasoline for fuel and to use a mixture of water and antifreeze to keep the engine cool. We function best when we run on God, when God is at the center of our lives. That's just how we were made, to run on having God at the center of our lives. So when we say, I'm trying to be the me that I want to be, we're talking about becoming what we really want to be deep down inside of us. As a matter of fact, we may not even know exactly what that is. We do know that we have moments when we raise our voices with other people. Moments when we grow impatient with our children or our spouses. Moments when we say things that are har harsh and hurtful to someone else. Moments when we do things that we later regret. But after, we usually realize what we have done and we regret our actions because we know that we do not want these actions to define us. That's not who we want to be. There are times in our lives when we pursue the wrong things, when we establish poor priorities. We may spend inordinate amounts of time and energy chasing things that we should not. Some of those things may be wicked and evil and unabashedly sinful. But other things may be good in and of themselves, enabling us to be more successful, to be better providers, to experience more of what life has to offer, to enjoy the finer things of life. But even those things can draw us away from God. We were designed, we were created to live God-centered lives. Now this Holy Spirit of God dwells in each one of us whether we know it or not. That Holy Spirit is God inside us giving us an appetite, giving us a hunger, giving, a, giving us a desire for God. That Holy Spirit shows us our need for God. The Spirit guides us to want to become God's best version of us, to become the me I want to be. We want that for ourselves. Now last week we mentioned two things that were important to our faith journey, and those two things were prayer and Scripture. We talked about 
turning to them regularly, kind of the way we stop for gas, we stop for coffee, we stop for a bathroom break while we are driving a long distance on our journey. And we considered how reluctant some of us are to, to stop, to interrupt our trip. We're anxious to get there. That sometimes we're so consumed with getting there that we won't, don't want to take the time to stop. And some of us wait so long before we stop that we almost run out of gas completely or we start to drive off the road and run over the rumble strips that are there to remind us that we are falling asleep. In the same way, we can be so consumed with our own agendas, our own life plan that we don't want to or we don't feel like we can slow down, take the time to pray or to read God's Word when it may be precisely what we need at that particular moment in our lives the most. So let's talk a little bit more about prayer. When you think of praying to God, do you feel like you can because it's been so long since you've done it? Do you feel like you can't pray to God because it's been an awfully long time since you last had a prayerful conversation with God? Do you feel like the only time you can call on God is when you want something, when you need something? And do you feel like then that because the only time you call upon God is, is when you want something and when you need something that maybe you really shouldn't be calling on God and, and so you're reluctant to pray to God, don't let that prevent you. Don't let that prevent you from calling on God. Some of you out there have children. And some of you have children where you've had this experience where your children were embarrassed to ask you. Or they would, just wouldn't ask. Or they were too prideful to ask. Or whatever the case may be. And when you can have that conversation with him, you'll look them in the eye and you'll say, you can call on me anytime. I'm your father. I'm your mother. That's why I'm here. That's who I am. That's what I do. And it's the same thing with God. Don't let those things interfere with your willingness to call on God. You see, lots of things interfere with our willingness to call on God. Things like a busy schedule is one thing. Enormous responsibilities in our lives is another. Watching too much television can be still another. And sin, the sins in our lives can also interfere as well. In his book, John Ortberg says, we should just be open and talk to God about our struggles about the stuff that we're dealing with. We don't need to clean up our words or our actions to speak with God. God can help with that. We tend to be preoccupied by our problems when we have a heightened sense of vulnerability and a diminished sense of power to do anything about our problems. When we get in that place, we feel like we're on shaky ground. But I'm telling you, friends, God will use your problems to grow a better you. God is a constant and gracious listener to our every thought. Prayer begins when we bring what we most naturally think about before God. So, for example... So, for example, your prayer could be, God, I am so angry with my spouse today, or I am so angry with my child, or I am so angry with my parent that I could just spit. Will you help me with this? I hate being like this. Or, or your prayer could be, God, I hate the people who cut me off in my commute to work. Will you help me? with my frustration? Will you make me less intense? Or you could say, Jesus, I just feel overwhelmed with everything. I feel incompetent and worthless. Will you help me to feel better about myself? Because I don't like being this way. What is the goal of prayer anyway? Is it to report to God? Is it to grovel before God? Listen carefully to what John Ortberg says. He says this on page 134 of his book. The goal of prayer, the goal of prayer is to live all of my life and speak all of my words 
in the joyful awareness of the presence of God. The goal of prayer is to live all of my life and speak all of my words in the joyful awareness of the presence of God. So friends, as long as we have unsolved problems, as long as we have unfulfilled desires and a mustard seed of faith, then we have all we need for a vibrant prayer life. Now let's go back to the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. You ever think about that? What's that mean? You ever think, what's that mean? Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Quench means to put out, right? It means to minimize the effectiveness of something. If you are thirsty and you quench your thirst, you are no longer thirsty. If there is a fire and you quench the fire, it is no longer burning. Quenching the Holy Spirit, though, friends, is, is pretty dangerous for us if we, attempt, if we are attempting to follow God, because quenching the Holy Spirit is like disconnecting a smoke alarm in your house or disconnecting your GPS when you're driving and you're counting on that very GPS to help you find your way. The Holy Spirit functions to nudge you and to guide you to say certain things and to do certain things, not because it makes God happy, but because it's what's best for you. The Spirit will steer you away from one thing and steer you toward something else. For all of you who have cars, and that's probably almost all of us, you have an owner's manual. Your owner's manual of your car was bit written by the same people who built your car. And in that owner's manual, it says you should use a certain type of oil, a certain grade. You should use a certain type of gas, a certain octane rating. You should use a specific size of tire. You should use certain cleaners and polishers for the finish on your car. It does not say, for example, in your manual that it's okay to use steel wool to get off a stubborn spot from bird debris. And you see, it's like that. God knows what's best for us. God knows what's best for you. God knows what's best for you. And it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us of our need for God. And it's the Holy Spirit who will always try to keep you in harmony with God. When we are faced with temptation, when we struggle in any way, when we are frustrated or angry, when we feel like we're losing control, the Spirit will prompt you to set things before God and to ask this question, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Or the Spirit may prompt you to ask yourself, like when you're tempted, if I walk down this road, where will it lead me in the long run? Will it lead me toward God or away from God? Will it lead me toward or away from the me I want to be? We may drift away from God. We will drift away from God. We will sin in some way. We sin every day. And when we sin, very often we are ignoring those nudges of the Holy Spirit in us. But we can always come back. We can always come back. God is always eager to welcome us back. And when we come back, God always says, I am glad you are here. I am not neutral about your existence. Do not be discouraged, not even about your own failings. This is a little picture of grace. Now, we started this message at the beach, remember? Remember? If we took a survey of the people here, we would find lots of people who approach the water in each of the ways I described, and that's okay. That's okay, as it pertains to the beach. 
My concern is that lots of people are just as timid and distant with God. There are some who are immersed in God like those who jump in the ocean, but there are others who are more timid and guarded and more cautionary, and and they sit pretty far back, and they watch from a distance. And I'm here to tell you this morning, friends, that's not okay. That's not okay. God created you in the image of God. You are the crown of God's creation. As amazing as animals are, whales and dolphins, just spectacular how they communicate with one another. As beautiful as roses are, as delicious as mangoes are, you are superior to all of them. God did God's best work in you when God made you. And Jesus came that you may have life in all its fullness, just not, not, not just as you define fullness with your limited understanding, but real, true fullness. If you want to have that fullness, and it's available to all of us, if you want to be the me I want to be, if you want to be God's best version of you, then you will need to dive into God. You will need to let go, jump in, and let God work in your life. You will need to immerse yourself in God, and you will need to listen to the Holy Spirit in your life.